really looks like all of the countries in our region are facing similar problems. And since Lithuania was one of the first countries to pursue austerity measures, I think that, uh, and I hope that uh, the example of Lithuania may offer some, some valuable lessons to Slovakia. So, um, in my presentation, I will overview the austerity measures that Lithuania pursued over the past five years and look into their success and um, offer some insights that may be useful. Um, so, what was the situation that Lithuania found itself in 2008? Prior to 2008, our economy was booming, we had some tax cuts, um, but our budget deficits uh, were always present. In fact, we, we, had, we had budget surplus more than once over the past 20 years. And by mid-2008, it became clear that the economy will slow down. And the main question was, will this be a soft landing or will it be a hard landing? And I remember very vividly an answer given by Remedius Shemashis, who is Minister of Justice of Lithuania and former president of the Lithuanian Free Market Institute, who is here today with us. And he said that it can be a soft landing, but in order for that to happen, the government has to prepare and to do its homework. And unfortunately, that was not done. And when the new center-right wing coalition came to power in late 2008, it found that the Remedius was part of as well. Um, it found a big gaping hole in the state budget finances. Lithuania is one of the few countries that operates under a currency board arrangement, which means that our central bank couldn't pursue any inflationary policies. So in the absence of a monetary solution, if anybody believes that there is one, um, our government was really forced to focus on the budgetary policy. So it therefore comes as no surprise that the first changes that were made were made on the revenue side, on taxes. Uh, the parliament worked overnight to pass numerous tax laws. It changed all in all 106 uh, law articles. And there were numerous tax increases. The corporate income tax rate was raised from 15 to 20 percent. There was a temporary VAT increase from 18 to 19 percent. Excise duties were raised on alcohol and on energy products. There were tax raises for individual business owners and also the uh, lower 5% VAT rate on foods and other products was uh, abolished. And within a month, it became clear that the projected tax revenues were too optimistic and that the budget had to be amended. And our government kept on talking about the enormous budget cuts. Well, in fact, these were cuts in projected revenues. Uh, so the for corporate income tax rate, uh, it was cut to 59% of the original level. For VAT, it was cut to 73% of the original level. For um, excise duties, to 82%. And the tax increases added to the deep recession that Lithuania was undergoing. And overall, our GDP contracted by 15%. And the tax increases led to a surge in the shadow economy. And it increased from 18% of GDP in 2008 to 27% in 2010, according to a survey done by the Lithuanian Free Market Institute. And this outcome is very much in line with Laffer's curve. So here you have the famous Laffer's curve. Here on the x-axis you have the tax rate. On the y-axis you have the tax revenues. And there are two situations where, when you will have zero tax revenues. If the tax rate is zero, and if it is 100. And here on this side, if you raise taxes, you will end up collecting less money. And on the left-hand side, uh, if, you, if you lower taxes, um, you will end up uh, getting more, more uh, revenues. And Lithuania was on the right-hand side, so raising the tax rate uh, led to lower tax revenues. Um, so after the overnight tax reform, there was a lot of uh, dissatisfaction and even one protest. People were smashing our parliament's windows. And up to this day, the word overnight tax reform is one of the biggest swear words in Lithuania. And the government admitted some mistakes were made and it uh, decided to roll back the corporate income tax increase. 
and it was uh, decreased in 2009 from 20% to 15% to its previous level. So I know that this is something that the Slovak government is considering. Well, we've been there, done that, it didn't work. So that's one of the lessons to be learned. Uh, and excise duty on diesel was uh, reduced as well, and there were some other changes made to, to taxes. The government kept its promise that the 19% tax rate of VAT is temporary. It was temporary, it lasted for nine months, then it was raised to 21%, and we still have it today. Um, so now let's look at the spending side. How, what are the different ways in which you can have spending? Well, the first one, and it, it appears to be the most popular in all the countries that pursue austerity, is cutting um, planned increases in spending. So imagine this year you are spending 100 euros and you make plans to spend 120. And suddenly your financial situation changes and you find yourself that you have to pursue austerity to save, economize. So you cut your spending to 110 euros. Is this a cut in spending? No, it's just a cut in your wishes. It means that you are spending more than, than uh, the previous year, but um, that is what many governments have been pursuing, and they, uh, they falsely call it a spending cut. Another way is to pursue horizontal spending cuts. So if you imagine if this is money spent on each function of the state, you cut, you cut it horizontally. And it means doing the same functions with less money. This is easier to implement, but it works up to a certain point. For example, you cannot really cut everything by 50%. Uh, this way of cutting spending tends to lower the quality of services. For example, if police uh, has, cannot go on all calls because they're saving fuel, that will lead to lower customer satisfaction with the services performed by the state. And the third way, which is the most difficult, is making vertical cuts. It means actually cutting some of the functions and saying that the state will not perform these functions anymore. And uh, this way of cutting spect uh, spending uh, requires uh, very much needed reforms in areas of healthcare, of social insurance, and cutting wasteful government spending. But, of course, the question is, which government spending is wasteful? In order to know which budget programs waste money, you have to have some sort of efficiency indicators. And if you do not have them, it means this way is virtually possible. Or you can, you can cut the functions, but you will not really know if these are, uh, if these are the least necessary ones. Um, you can also have a conditional budget clause. Now, that is a proposal that the Lithuanian Free Market Institute proposed over a decade ago, and it was partially introduced in 2010. Now, in our budget, it says that if uh, the planned revenues fall to, by uh, at least 3% of the planned revenues, there will be an automatically, automatic provision of the budget. Uh, but for true implementation of this, of this um, uh, conditional budget, you would really have to assign priorities to each budget program and to group them. For example, if there is a program A, let's say pensions, you say spending on pensions will never be cut, and people know that for sure. Then there is program B type, so where some spending cuts can be made, for example, roads. And then the least efficient or least needed spending, let's say program C, um, that is where spending is abolished if the revenues fall short of the projections. So each country has uh, notorious examples of government waste. Um, we have social advertisement, but I'm sure or you can have, you can add uh, digging ditches to that um, to that uh, uh, group, but. So the unnecessary spending is the one that that should uh, should be thrown out first when when you do not collect the money. So Lithuania uh, pursued the cuts in um, cuts in spending wishes and uh, some uh, horizontal cuts. So over the four years, our nominal state budget was reduced by 12 percent, 
the number of uh, bureaucrats was reduced by one tenth, and the spending on salaries was cut. And uh, these cuts were progressive. It means that the top salaries were cut by most, by 36%. But however, total spending in our state budget on bureaucrat salaries is one tenth of total state budget. So you can fire them all, and you will still have 90% of spending that there will be no people uh, to pursue it. So uh, it is good to cut, um, to cut spending on bureaucrat salaries, but it also works up to a certain level. So here you can see uh, Lithuania, the trend in Lithuania state budget. So you can see that the red line, which shows expenditure, Yes, there was a mild decrease, but it's not nearly as sharp as the decrease in revenues that are in the blue line. And in our state social insurance fund, there is even a worse story here. The annual deficits have been exceeding 2% every year. And we had budget surpluses before 2008. And today, our, our state social insurance fund's total debt stamps at 10.5%. And we had pension cuts that were temporary. Uh, we had maternity benefit cuts. We had um, transfers into second pension pillar cut from 5.5% to 3%, then to 2%, then most recently to 1.5%. And uh, that's something that uh, Slovakia is also pursuing. And uh, the point of the second pension pillar is to cushion the blow that will come from the demographic troubles in the coming decades. So you are sacrificing um, a long-term solution for a short-term fix that doesn't really fix anything. It didn't fix the, the, the cut in transfers, didn't fix the problem with our state social insurance fund. And as a result, our debt nearly tripled over the past five years. It went up from 17% in 2007 to 41% in 2012. So what the Czech Republic was able, it took 11 years, we were able to do in five years to achieve the same result, which of course is a, a sad story. Um, so in late 2011, Lithuania once again found itself in the middle of a budget crisis. And there were bleak or renewed forecasts that showed that there is a new budget cap. And the question was, well, how should we fill this budget cap? 2011 was different from 2008 because our government spent three years in power and one of the things that they did uh, was that they began cleaning up the state-owned enterprises. Um, there is a true story about a Canadian state-owned enterprises where an economist was walking in, in um, Canada's parliament and he was called into a, a a committee meeting of the, of the finance and budget committee meeting where they had the chief auditor and uh, and they asked this economist could you please ask the chief auditor any question and he asked well how many state-owned enterprises are there in Canada and the chief auditor said I don't know well what do you mean you don't know don't you audit them well yes what we know about them <laughs> and so in Lithuania uh, the, the first step is that it counted how many state-owned enterprises it has and it began uh, making the, the whole system more transparent. And here in this figure you can see the dividends that came from state-owned enterprises. Before 2009, the, it was very little. And here you have the face of our Prime Minister, Andrus Kubilis, and the, uh, the uh, dividends went up. But of course, Yes, that is a good thing, but um, a, a better thing to do would be to sell them. So imagine if this is the budget hold that we had at the end of 2011. Then according to the same scale, that's how many stocks are owned by the state. And that's the long-term material assets owned by the state. And these are the total financial assets. And these are the total assets owned by the state. And the politicians still have a question, how should we fill the budget hole? When selling even a small fraction of the, of the state-owned assets would have easily filled it and we would have had um, even a budget surplus. 
So how did they fill the budget hole? Well, they didn't pursue any privatization, unfortunately. Fortunately, they did a spending cut that fully uh, filled the new budget hole. And then unfortunately, the, the whole um, discussion how to fill the budget cut sparked this competition among politicians who will offer uh, more and bigger tax increases. And there was a real competition, and that led to introduction of residential property tax of 1%. Uh, new copyright levies on devices. The land tax was raised, natural resources taxes were raised, and numerous other taxes were raised, and there are still plans for more and higher taxes that may be fulfilled in, in the future. Uh, so what are some of the lessons that, that can be learned from the Lithuanian example? Well, horizontal spending cuts um, were needed, but they were not enough. State social insurance fund is very vulnerable to negative economic changes, and uh, it should be reformed to allow for more flexibility. It is called a pay-as-you-go system, but it's not really a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, if, if it relies on borrowing for so much. And the lack of efficiency indicators uh, means that the government is unable to, to pursue vertical spending cuts. So the state has an inclination to raise taxes, and I think it's the case in, in all of our countries. That is something that the private sector cannot really pursue. But tax increases in Lithuania didn't really solve problems. They weren't a solution. If anything, they added to the problems, they deepened the recession, they caused the shadow economy, um, and that will be a big question for our coming government, how to, how to solve that problem. And they reaffirmed Latter's curve, and they showed that we were on the right-hand side, so decreasing uh, tax rates should result in bigger revenues. And I think one of the most important lessons here is that governments should prepare for uh, bad times at good times, and they should prepare for attractions by identifying wasteful spending, by making priorities, and by making a commitment to cut uh, wasteful spending when um, when the revenues fall, or even better, even in good times. And it's a lesson that spending should not be rigid. It should be flexible. It should reflect the economic realities, and it should reflect revenues. Because otherwise, you are there's a big danger that you will follow on a path that is very dangerous, and that our Southern European uh, member states do not really know how to get out of.